Even for hardened American voters, the process of selecting a candidate to run for president can seem convoluted, confusing, this is ridiculous. This whole process has been screwed up. And sometimes just plain weird. Everybody who is in favor of Bernie Sanders, please raise your hand. Here's what you need to know to make sense of it. Every four years, presidential candidates travel the length and breadth of the country in pursuit of their party's nomination. The support they get in each state or territory translates to delegates who attend the national convention in the summer where the party's choice for president is announced. Those state contests take one of two broad forms. Primaries work like regular elections in the sense that primary voters cast their votes in ballot boxes and then the totals are added up to see who's won. Caucuses are essentially public votes rather than private ones. What happens during a caucus is that there are meetings statewide in places like town halls and school gyms, and the caucus goers gather in different groups to support the candidate that they like. Caucuses can get particularly confusing. At some, voters can switch from one group to another during the course of the event, until the delegates are eventually allocated in proportion to each candidate's final tally. In 2016, the Democratic Party held 14 state caucuses as part of its nominating procedure. In 2020, just three. Caucuses are falling out of fashion in part because they're so time consuming for caucus goers, but also because they're really complicated for state parties to administer. What happened in Iowa? The smartphone app did not work as promised. The chaos at the Iowa caucuses this year may prove to be the death knell for this way of picking candidates. That's the thing about this whole process. The rules can change from year to year, from state to state, and from party to party. Thank you. Thank you. Even just the question of who's allowed to vote draws a bewildering array of answers. The important thing about who votes in primaries is that they tend to be more ideological and more politically engaged than the electorate as a whole. That means that the candidates running in primaries tend to have to play to their base, and then as soon as the primary's over, they have to try and tack back towards the center. Over the years, the primary calendar has regularly shifted, in part because states that vote early can hold more sway. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. The Democratic contest is still wide open. We're going to give it everything we have, as we have in every single state and caucus in the country. But it may not be that simple. In the 1988 Democratic primary, a group of southern states banded together and agreed to hold their primaries on the same day. Super Tuesday was their effort to nominate the kind of moderate Democrat southerners tend to vote for. The primary voting day political pundits have been talking about for months finally arrived today. Thanks, Bob. The inventors of Super Tuesday in the Democratic Party wanted to steer the nomination to a southern moderate, or at least a moderate from somewhere, and keep down Democratic voter defections to the Republicans in November. In 2020, California became the latest and most delegate-rich state to vote early. More than a third of the delegates up for grabs in the Democratic primary are now allocated on Super Tuesday. After Super Tuesday, the field almost always narrows. We are suspending our campaign. As state polls continue into the spring or summer. The primary process culminates at the party convention, where delegates pledged to each candidate formally cast their vote. I proudly cast 163 votes for the first woman president of the United States of America, Hillary Clinton. Usually this is political theater. The front runner already guaranteed the support of a majority of delegates. But very occasionally, in a close race, the convention can become a real contest. If candidates stay in the race right up until the bitter end in July, that makes it likelier that one candidate can lead in the primary without ever having won a majority of votes. And if that candidate fails to win a majority, voting continues until they or someone else can. At this point, all bets are off, because after the first ballot, delegates no longer have to vote for the candidate they were pledged to support. 
the horse trading that follows might even oust the front runner. In 2020, this is how a contested convention could, in theory, prevent Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden from winning the Democratic Party's nomination. There's a scenario where Bernie Sanders is in front but doesn't quite manage to win a majority of delegates. In that case, I think he would be the nominee anyway. It would simply be too difficult for the convention in Milwaukee to take the nomination away from a front runner. I humbly accept your nomination. I accept your nomination. Once the nominee is formally revealed, there's just one small matter remaining. Reporting for duty. Winning the general election. To keep up to date with all our coverage of the 2020 presidential election, please sign up to our Checks and Balance newsletter. There's a link to do that opposite. It'll arrive in your inbox every Friday with a selection of stories from The Economist and some other good stuff in there too. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching. Thank you.